Good morning, Mamas. Last weekend, I had the opportunity to attend the Modern Homesteading Conference here in North Idaho. And I wanted to share with you a few of my takeaways and a little bit of the highlights of the weekend. So first, let me know down in the comments if you were at the Modern Homesteading Conference this weekend. So this weekend, I did not take nearly enough pictures and I didn't end up taking any videos. And I'm sorry, guys. I I kind of dropped the ball on that one. When I got there at the time, I was just focused on learning as much as I could and trying to keep my eyes open for any um, and all of the speakers that I wanted to talk to and making sure that I connected with everyone that I really needed to talk to. And I think I did, except for one. I couldn't make any of her talks and I couldn't, I never ended up running into her anywhere and she didn't have a booth or anything. So that one I was a little disappointed in, but hopefully she'll be back next year. I think she is coming back next year. I can't remember. I'll have to look and see, but it's just so it's from Roots and Refuge. That was the one speaker that I couldn't get to. But other than that, I was super happy with the choices I made because every session had like four or five, I think, choices. And it was hard to pick. There were some really good speakers there this year. And I didn't get to see some of my older favorites that I got to see last year at last year's conference. But I had gotten to see them last year. So I wanted to make sure I grabbed the new speakers that were here this year that weren't there last year and I had not met them yet. So that I was pretty happy about. Other than Jess, the, I was able to see the rest of the ones that I was really looking forward to, to meeting. If you would like to read the blog post about everything I'm going to be talking about in this video, the link for that is going to be down in the description below. So you can go check that out. And for anything that I am mentioning in this video, you will find links for those below. So any of the speakers I've mentioned, I will put links to where you can find them. They're blog websites, their regular websites, their um, Instagrams, vi uh, YouTube video channels, if they have them, um, all the things. If you want to go find them so that you can start following them, I'll have those links down below. As well as any books that I talk about. Um, there's at least two speakers that have books um, that I got and I'll put links to those down below. I know there's a couple of, of books coming out that aren't out yet. I will go ahead and put those down below as well. And I'll put them under each speaker so that you can go to the speaker, find where to find them online. And then if they have any books, I'll have a link for their books there as well. So the very first session, I went to Carolyn's Preserving Food on the Fly class. And though I don't know that any of the methods that she was going over really were anything new to me, but I still had a great takeaway from her class. And that was just a good reminder because I've heard a couple of people say this before, probably even <laughs> Carolyn, um, telling us to not try to copy the grocery store. And this time, it stuck. It was a really good reminder to stop trying to copy the the grocery store and focusing on growing the vegetables and produce and fruits that want to grow in your area and not trying to keep growing things that just don't want to grow here. And in North Idaho, we're pretty limited. We can grow pretty much any kind of a root vegetable and we can grow almost all of the winter squash. And of course, all of your cool loving plants like peas and brassicas and um and lettuces and stuff your greens but any warm loving crops really struggle and so I have to really fight for those tomatoes and peppers <laughs> my peppers just don't want to do very good so that was takeaway number one was to not try to copy the grocery store in your pantry. I want to take a quick minute here while we're talking, while I just talked about Carolyn from Homesteading Family, 
I want to let you guys know that she had the homestead, I'm getting it up here for you, the homestead or in the homestead kitchen. Um, this is her summer anthology recipe book. And hopefully you guys can see it there. I'll put another one up on the screen here in a minute. And there'll be a th flip through for the magazine. This is, um, this is going over uh, just a few of the um, magazines that she has already done. The ones on, uh, there's a strawberry section, a zucchinis, peaches, tomatoes, and sweet peppers in this magazine. And this is good. I mean, this is a thick magazine. It's got lots of information in it. And so this is kind of basically a sampling of her in the Homestead Kitchen magazine subscription. So if you guys are interested in this, they debuted this anthology recipe book at the Modern Homestead Conference this weekend, or last weekend. And if you would like a copy, they still have copies of these that you can order and I will put the link for that down below underneath where I said that um, each speaker will have their list of how to contact them or find them online and then any books and stuff that um, she has so I will put the link to this down there in the description below I am an affiliate with Homesteading Family, so if you do go use my link, then you will be also helping me and my family out and supporting this channel. Also, I will put the link if you really liked this and you would like to get the subscription, the monthly subscription. They are currently digital, but they're going to print in January. And if you get the subscription now you will get locked in at that price because once they go to print they're going to have to up the price to cover the cost which is understandable so if you get in with the digital copy right now then you will get locked into that price and then start getting automatically start getting the print copy in january so i highly recommend that this is a really good book i haven't read all the way through it yet but as you've seen in the flip through video there that she's got great recipes in there and lots of information. It's really, really good. So check out those links, both the links that I'll put down below for those two things, the summer anthology recipe book, as well as the in the homestead magazine subscription are both affiliate links. So if you go use my link, then thank you very much for supporting my family. So next I went to see Lisa from Farmhouse on Boone and that was a really good talk. She had packed so much information and tips into her class and she was talking about getting three from scratch meals a day on the table without losing your mind. And she had so much good information it was hard to keep up with it because she was talking really fast, but I got, I got a lot out of that class. And the biggest takeaway I got from her class was to pull your meat out of the freezer for the week. So however much you need for one meal and then of that kind of meat, and then just pull five days worth of meat out at the beginning of the week. Just pull it all out of the freezer and put it in the fridge. And I've always had a hard time. I get stuck on, um, I have to plan so I know what I'm pulling out of the freezer. And that was always a big hang up for me because I want to be in the mood for something. I'm not one that tends to be okay just eating whatever. I have to like be in the mood for it. So it's very difficult to have, not have a plan for it. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. So I can't pull it out until I know what I'm going to do with it because I don't know what I'm going to want. And so having her say that, for, and I've heard her say this before in one of her videos, I'm sure, but it clicked this time 
it was just like, okay, maybe that's all I need to do. I just need to get over the fact that I feel like I need to plan before I pull it out. Because she mentioned you'll figure out what you're going to use it for as you go. And it'll be ready for you. The meat's already going to be thawed and you aren't going to have the stress of it's still frozen in the freezer when I want it. And so that really helped this time. I don't know why it took me forever to have that really click in my head because I've been a mom for over 11 years now or just over 11 years. He just turned 11 and I had never really figured that out because I just kept getting hung up on that. I have to have a plan for it before I pull it out of the freezer. And when she really opened my eyes, it's like, you know, if you pull out some ground meat, that's going to thaw first. So figure that one out first after you've got it in the fridge. And then, you know, if you end up pulling a whole chicken out, then, you know, that'll be for later in the week because that's going to take a couple days to thaw. And it just, it made so much more sense. And so when I got home, I actually started implementing that right away. I think it, it may have been Monday before I pulled meat out. But I pulled, I think, four days worth of meat out because I think it was Monday already at that point instead of Sunday, which I'm planning on doing it earlier this next week, maybe even today <laughs> for next week. And so far it's been working out really great. I, I pulled some random meats out. I got some chicken out and I got some uh, pork loins out and some steak out. And then um, one, a pound of Italian sausage, my home ground, um, and my personal home made uh, Italian sausage seasoning. And I didn't know what I was gonna do with any of it, but I pulled it out and so far, what I ended up doing was I did use the Italian sausage first cause it's ground, it thaws super fast. And I wasn't really sure what I was gonna do cause I'm not really a big spaghetti and meatballs fan, but the rest of the family is. So I was kind of tossing that around. We could probably do spaghetti and then I'll just make some little tiny meatballs to go in the spaghetti with the Italian sausage or just fry it up and crumble it in, into the sauce. But then later I was actually talking with my husband and he's like, well, I always like lasagna. I'm like, why didn't I think of that? We can have lasagna. Why don't we have lasagna with Italian sausage? I know we usually it's made just with um, ground hamburger, but it's really good with Italian sausage, by the way. If you haven't had your um, lasagna made with Italian sausage before, try it. You'll thank me later. It's amazing. Anyway, so I did that. I went to the pantry to pull out some lasagna noodles and didn't even have any. So I improvised. I went ahead and I used some penne pastas and I still kind of layered it. Um, I mixed the meat, the sauce and the pasta together. And then I put a layer of that down on the bottom of the pan. And then I put a layer of my um, mozzarella cheese and cottage cheese and then finish off the other half of the pasta mixture on top of that and then another really good thick layer of mozzarella cheese and then put that in the oven and it was actually still done in time for dinner. I started it plenty early, the meat was already thawed, everything went really smoothly. Other than I didn't think about making like breadsticks or something to go with it, but it was, it was a good meal and it was quick and easy. The next night we had um, the steaks. Those were all thawed out and I pulled them out in plenty of time for them to come up to room temperature and got um, our favorite seasoning on top of it, which is actually a store-bought brand. If you have Kinder's brand seasonings, they're really actually pretty clean. Um, this one has sunflower oil in it, which for some people are trying to stay away from all seed oils, but there's no soy in that, and which is what I'm trying to stay away from right now it's i'm not doing it completely yet but that is something that i'm trying to focus on so takeaway number two was to pull your meat out don't need to plan first you can plan as you go 
and it does work. The third speaker that I went to go see was actually a good friend of mine, Esther from Esther's Eden. And she did an elderberry syrup demo and I loved her demo. It was really nice. She was in her element. It was so great to see her in her element. And she was, she knows this so well that she can just run through it and make it look perfect, honestly. Despite the fact that we had a little problem with the the propane stove to get her water boiler, get, you know, get the, um, get the berries boiling. Um, and, but she just ran with it. She, she kept going and it didn't even seem to affect her. I'm sure she'll say that, you know, she got a little flustered, but she did great. It was awesome. And I even learned something. I've made elderberry syrup a few times, but I'm still learning about elderberries. I'm new to the area because we've only been here in North Idaho for a little while. And where I lived, I didn't know anything about elderberries. Um, and I hadn't really looked into them yet for medicinal, like, you know, taking it for when you're sick and stuff or preventing sick. And so it was really nice. Um, I also want to mention she has a brand new online course, digital course. You uh, sign up for the course and you, then you'll have life, lifetime access to it. And it is really good. I have it. I looked through it. It is packed with really good information. Everything from starting with the foraging to propagating all the way to preserving your berries and making syrup. So Definitely go check out her course. I will put that down in the description below underneath her name and with all of her contact um, ways to find her online. So takeaway number three for the conference, I found out, and I didn't know this before, was the different elderberries types have different levels of toxicity. And... The red ones, obviously, I knew that pretty early on looking into elderberries. You just stay away from the red elderberries. The European black elderberries have a tolerable amount. You just cook them long enough and you're good. The American black and blue elderberries are the least amount and you don't have to cook them as long. So that was really important interesting information and I thought that was really cool that we could find some here because I had just been ordering them online and they are the European variety so just need to find where to forage them or be looking for it and actually on my way home from the conference I saw a whole bunch of them because they were blooming that weekend <laughs> so I found some of them but they were along the highway so I need to find another area that's not right on the highway but it was pretty cool I was, noticed them this time instead of before I drove by and didn't even realize they were there okay the last session for day one was a Q&A round table and I didn't get the chance to go to one of those I didn't really know what they were last year um, it seemed interesting but there was another class going at the same time that I really wanted to go to last year so I didn't end up going to it. So I wanted to make sure I at least went to one. And I went to this first one and loved it so much that I ended up going to the second one the second day. Um, so the first round table, the very last session of day one had um, Jessica Sowers, which I wanted to make sure I got to see her at least there, um, since I wasn't going to be making any of her classes after I made my final decision on where I was going to, who I was going to go see. And, um, and then she had, there was, um, Joel and Dan, Daniel Salatin, Robin Jackson, Dr. Patrick Jones, and Melissa K. Norris were all on that round table. And that was a fun, fun round table. That was awesome. Um, what they do in this round table is it's basically to 
let the audience come up and ask questions of whoever or all of the participant speakers up there. Um, they call it a round table though, because it's to put everybody at the round table. Remember, you know, King Arthur and his knights at the round table, meaning that King Arthur wanted all, all of his knights to feel like they, they could come and talk to him on a level playing field. And so that's why they call this the round table is because it's a level playing field. Like they've been doing this for a long time. There's a lot of people in the audience that have been doing this just as long as they have too. They just don't have a YouTube or website or something, or maybe they have one. It, they're just not as big and popular as some of the, some of the speakers are, but it, it's a, it's a round table to level the playing field for everybody, to put everybody at, at the same level that we can just talk and have community with each other, that they're not way above us, they're not better than us, they're just like us. So I thought that was really cool. And this particular round table, especially between Pat... Uh, Dr. Jones and da Daniel and Joel because Daniel's a lot like his dad in this they both crack jokes crack it, it's it's hilarious they're fun to watch and listen to and and making jokes all the time it's just hilarious and Patrick Jones is 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 no different he's he's quite comical to uh, listen to and talk to it's he, it's a lot of fun so that was a really really good session. So after the Q&A, we had a pretty short break for um, dinner. And um, so I kind of snacked on some snacks I had and I was walking around and um, I stopped at Sean and Beth Doherty's uh, booth for a few minutes, but I was starting to not feel good. So I ended up leaving early. So I was a little disappointed that I wasn't filling up for it um, because the keynote speaker for the conference was Temple Grandin. And I ended up needing to leave. Um, I needed to rest. I was exhausted. And, um, and I needed some real food and not just snacks in my stomach. So um, I went ahead and headed out and... Um, for the evening and then um, didn't come back till the next morning. But I will say that you can find, if you've never heard Temple speak, you can find some of her talks on like TED Talks and other ones, uh, interviews and stuff like that on um, YouTube. Just go search Temple Grandin on YouTube and you'll get a whole bunch of stuff. And um, there is a movie out there called Temple Grandin. If you have not seen that yet, I highly recommend seeing that. Um, it's really good movie um, about her life and her autism and stuff. So I was disappointed that I didn't get to meet her. Day two, I got there early and I went straight to Sean and Beth's booth because I had just barely gotten a chance to start talking to them on Friday evening and I wanted to go back and talk to them more when I had a fresh head and I, I didn't have a headache anymore and I was feeling a lot better still really tired because I didn't sleep very well but um, I felt overall a lot more refreshed and you know not having a headache makes it a lot easier to talk to people so I had a great time talking to them and they're a wonderful couple. They've been doing this life since the eighties and I just, they make you feel like family. When you start talking to them, they make you feel like your family. And I think that's what I like so much about them is they're so comfortable to be around that you feel at home, no matter where you're at. And I just, I really like that atmosphere. Oh, well, hello, hi. The birds are landing on my camera. 
<laughs> anyway, so you can find um, Sean and Beth. Um, they are from the Sow's Ear Farm. And I will put a link to their website down below. And um, their talk, which was the first talk of the day, and I chatted with them almost all the way up to their, their talk. Their talk was um, homesteading. Why didn't I write it down? I didn't write it down here. Did I? Basically, homesteading on a budget. And um, they had some really good information. I mean, I, I consider myself pretty frugal mindset. Like, I tend to think very frugally. Um, but they did have some really good tips that really stood out to me. And it was more along the lines of changing a mindset that I still was hanging on to, unknowingly, of course. We have this lifestyle because we want to be different. We want to have fresher food so we grow it ourselves instead of, you know, buying the produce that's supposed to be fresh in the grocery store. But it's actually, in some cases, last year's harvest that they've just figured out how to keep for a whole year. Because unless, and or they're picking things really green down where they can grow year round in the south and then they ship it up here so that by the time it gets up here, it's finally ripe. And they've just lost so much of their nutrition, which also means they've lost a lot of their flavor by the time we get it. So when I've had a cantaloupe that was ripened on the vine right out of the field, and then I try to eat a cantaloupe that I bought at the store, it's so hard to eat that cantaloupe. And uh, tomatoes are like that too, carrots. Um, even the lettuce, it's starting to taste bad to me now that I'm growing some of that in my garden. And it, but even despite that, I still had too much of a mindset of commercial and modern models of farming whether it's, you know, putting that into your garden or the way you work your animals and, and stuff like that. And just trying to physically just remove that from your mindset completely and getting back to from scratch. Where am I at now? What do I have right now? What is my property like? What will work with my property? And looking at it from that standpoint instead of this well I got to look like this over here when that's not even feasible for where you're at um, or could be even unless you have that non-commercial old school homestead style mindset so that was takeaway number four for the conference was a mindset shift when you're looking at your property for your homestead and the animals and your garden and what you're growing. And I thought that went tied in really well with what Carolyn had said at the very beginning, the first session was not trying to copy the grocery store in your pantry, not trying to grow the vegetable that doesn't want to grow in your garden. So that felt like a whole completely different shift. Um, Cause even even Lisa talking about pulling things out and not planning it, we tend to get sucked into the, the Pinterest kitchen and the meal planning and everything. And, oh, we have this image that looks really pretty. And then we put that in our head and then think we have to do that. And we don't. And so getting rid of that, getting all of that out of our head was, is, is really what we need to do. It's a complete mind shift. A mindset shift. The second speaker for day two was Sally Fallon Moreau. And I got to uh, talk with Sally briefly at her booth early that morning before any of the sessions had started and um, had her sign my book. I'd gotten a book for gotten her book, Nourishing Traditions, for my birthday this year. Thank you, Mom. And uh, so I brought that with me to have her sign 
and she was very sweet to sign it. She is a wonderful lady. I've really enjoyed everything I've been learning about the nourishing traditions, diet, and that's what she spoke on. Um, but when I got to talk to her earlier in the morning, I, I asked her, I'm like, I'm really struggling, like fully like implementing all of this. And I had, I've, I've done the bone broth. I've been trying to implement that more in our diet somehow, whenever I could, it was easy in the winter because you just make a lot of soups with your bone broth. But now we're in summer. It's like, nobody wants soup right now. Cause it's too hot. Um, despite the fact that I'm wearing a sweatshirt, um, <laughs> It's, it's hot by dinner time. You know, we're getting into the afternoons and the evenings are really hot. It's cool in the morning, but hot in the afternoon evenings. Nobody wants to eat soup for dinner. Um, myself included. Um, so I've been struggling, like where else could I implement some stuff? Cause and, and I'd started looking at my ingredients on my condiments. I had already looked at my creamer. That was, you know, I realized that was one of my biggest issues because the, the two, the top, first two cre ingredients in the creamer I was drinking was soy and water. I'm like, there's no cream in this. I can't, how, how is this a creamer when there's no cream? Um, so I already switched that and that made a huge difference and help. And that's when I really realized that soy was my main culprit for some of the issues that I've been having. And so I got rid of that, found one that has cream in it for the meantime. Um, I'm going to be switching to something else soon. We'll see how it goes. But I had planned when I got back from the conference to start making my own mayonnaise from scratch because that's got soy in it when you buy it from the store. And I even checked the organic stuff and the like the olive oil um, mayonnaise and the avocado oil mayonnaise at the store. All of them had soy in it. I couldn't find a mayo that didn't have soy in it. So I'm like, okay, I have to make it from scratch. And I'm like, I've heard it's not that hard to make so this shouldn't be that big of a deal and um, we've been having a lot of salads lately because I'm growing salads so I have fresh lettuce from the garden and I I like ranch on my salad and that has soy in it too even a really good quality one which we've been using but it still has soy in it so I had decided okay the next two steps I'm going to do when I get back from the conference is make my own mayonnaise and make my own um, ranch. And when I was talking to Sally, she told me, she's like, I asked her, I was like, well, where do you start? Like, how do you start implementing this? Because you can't, when you're used to the typical American diet and um, convenience foods, and some of them are healthy, it's really hard to switch over to something completely different. You know, your family's gonna rebel, your kids are gonna be like, this is not what we were used to. Um, and and it's hard for me too. Um, and not just from a uh, preparing standpoint, but from also an eating standpoint. You know, when I put it on the table, do I really wanna eat this? Um, meats and stuff are pretty easy, so that's, that's not a big adjustment because I like my meat. <laughs> we all like our meat. We're, we love meat here, but trying to get rid of the processed foods, mainly your dressings and stuff, so your mayo, your ranch, your other things. So I, uh, when I asked her, she's like, oh, just start with your dressings. Just start with the dressings and then go from there and it'll get easier. And I'm like, okay, cool. That's what I was planning on doing. So I like that she just confirmed my thought process for moving forward. And so I knew I was already on the right track. So that was really cool to have her confirm that and, um, and give me that confidence to that I am on the right track and I'm moving forward and I, I can do this. So that was my, um, 
I think that's what I put down. I'm referring to my notes again. Um, yeah, takeaway number five for the conference for the whole weekend was that, you know, if you're trying to get healthier, then the easiest thing is to start with your dressings um, and start drinking raw cow's milk, raw dairy. Um, one thing I didn't talk to her before at her booth about this, but in her talk, she was just talking about the new, um, she was talking about, um, the nourishing traditions diet overall, but she was, she went into detail about the, uh, vitamin deficiencies that are in the, you know, majority of the American population being A, D, and K. And you can get, if I took my notes correctly, all three of those in raw dairy. Um, and you'll get more A in red meat. And especially if you eat, um, I believe it's the liver and the heart are the two things that have a lot of A in them. There's other things too. I don't remember them all. They're all in the book. I will put a link to her book, Nourishing Traditions, down in the description below, below her name, as well as her website, which is the Weston A. Price Foundation dot, I, I can't remember if it's dot com or dot org, but I'll have that link down below. She was, she's a very delightful lady. I really enjoyed meeting her. I was sad that I never asked her for a picture. I should have. And then I didn't. So, like I said, I didn't get all the pictures that I really wanted. I took a few, but um, I did miss a few pictures. So, unfortunately, that's where that is. Um, but, yeah, those are the two things that I'm going to start implementing in our family. Um, I did, when I get got home, I did make my first mayo I made the mistake of making it with olive oil. I will just want to warn you, don't make it with olive oil unless you really like the olive oil flavor because your mayo will taste like olive oil. And I don't mind that on certain things. Like when I made um, some pasta salad to go with our steak the other day, I used my homemade mayo. And it tastes just fine on there because it had like a ranch dressing. And my ranch dressing, I used my homemade mayo to make the ranch dressing and that tastes just fine. It just, there, I can, I'll have clips of that here, but the, it turned out okay. The mayo was fine. It's a little soft, but my ranch dressing is really runny and I don't know why that turned out that way, but I'm going to keep working with it. It tasted fine. It was just really, really runny. Um, and I'll, be doing more of a video on those two things and um, some other stuff too in the future it might be the next video maybe two videos so keep an eye out for that I will be talking uh, soon about some things that I make at home instead of buying not just to save money but to also improve health um, the third speaker for the second day of the conference was Mary Shriver from Mary's Nest I think I'm saying her name right. Um, and she spoke on uh, tips from the Great Depression, which I thought was really, really cool about um, all the different things that they would do because they didn't have a lot during the Great Depression. You used what you had, and um, and you figured it, and you figured it out from there because a lot of what they were used to using was in slow, low supply because they were shipping so much overseas to the troops. And when you put your mindset in that kind of a mindset, it really changes your perspective on how, what we have in this modern day is way more availability. And so I liked the, that mindset set chif, shift. I'm getting all tongue tied now. Um, so my takeaway for six for the conference was resetting your mind to think in terms of using it all up and, you know, not throwing things away prematurely. Um, because especially if it's something organic left over, 
Um, you know, she talked about, you know, running your bone, your bones for making bone broth and stuff multiple times until that bone is real soft and, you know, all the cartilage is gone. So you've used, you've gotten all the cartilage that you need off of those bones and then you can put that in your grinder and then you put that out on the garden and that will fertilize your garden. I hadn't realized that before. I had been putting them in my compost when I was done with them. I tried not to throw them away, but I didn't think about putting it like just directly on the garden. So um, I thought that was really good information. Just an extra step in making sure we use everything instead of, you know, just parts of, you know, the animal when we have a whole animal that we use the whole animal, not just you know, the muscle meat and then throwing everything else in the compost and feeling kind of like we're using it all. We're not, you know, getting rid of it all. But, um, yeah, so that was just really interesting. Some of the tips that she had, but that was the one that stood out the most was just using it all up, making sure we aren't wasting anything. The last session of the second day was the second round table. And this one had a different group, but just as amazing of a group. Um, Joel Salatin was back for this one. Josh and Carolyn were there. Josh and Carolyn Thomas were there. Sean and Beth Doherty, Sarah, uh, Sally Fallon Morell, Mary Schrader, and Ann Briggs. So it's not Shriver, it's Schrader. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they did a really good round table. There was really good questions that came up. Again, I didn't end up taking any notes on this, but the one thing that I feel resounded in this talk was that we're all equal. And I liked the, that, um, that, uh, the gal who kind of guided the whole thing was asked the speakers if there was any speaker that had a question for another speaker before she ended up opened it up to the audience it was that was a really cool idea I thought because even even the speakers that are up there they haven't learned it all either and so that was really cool to see a speaker asking another speaker a question um that you know that they didn't know yet how to do. So that was really cool about keeping everything on a level playing field. We're all equal, we're all in this life together. And that was just really awesome to see that. This year they did something a little bit different. I think a lot of people had asked about it um, in previous, uh, the previous year. Um, or it was just the fact that a lot of people had cr started creating a community. They found somebody else that they befriended at the last conference and are, were meeting back at the conference, this year's conference again for their friend anniversary or whatever. There was so many stories about that, that I've, I've heard around. And, um, I thought it was really cool that they stayed in touch over the last year after meeting at the conference. And so what they did this year was to have a big meet and greet out in the arena where people could, I mean, they tried to divide it up as best they could, but it was still pretty broad. I mean, they did like a section for Canadians. They did a section for Wyoming and Montana and Oregon and Washington and Idaho. But, and of course, Idaho being here, the majority of the people were from Idaho. There were some pretty good groups from Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Wyoming as well. But um, their, the group for Idaho was because Idaho is a huge state. So it's really hard to find people that were in your area. It's like a lot of us are like, okay, where are you from? And they figured out, you know, they needed kind of like a south, central, and northern Idaho section so maybe that's something they'll do next year is kind of divide Idaho up and I'm sure Oregon and Washington wanted to be divided up a little bit more too um, but overall it was really good meet and greet I ran into some friends and got to say hi and chit chat with them a little bit and I hadn't seen one of them all all weekend until then 
So it was good to catch up with them and, um, and yeah, just hanging out and just having that community was a really great way to end the conference. Heading and home and starting to really digest everything that I had been learning the whole weekend. So overall, it was a fantastic conference. I really enjoyed it. I look forward to going next year and next year I will try to have more video and more pictures for you guys. All right, that's it for my recap of the Modern Homesteading Conference. If you've made it this far, then put this secret emoji down in the comments below so I know you got all the way to the end. Don't forget to check out all those links below and we'll see you guys on the next one. Bye-bye.